Hello and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin. Today I'm once again joined by Lieutenant General Ravi Shankar, who uh, retired as the Director General of the Artillery in the Indian Army, and today is working uh, tirelessly to put out his views on various different subjects militarily affecting India. Thank you, sir, for joining me today. And uh, I hope we're going to uh, have a lovely discussion on a topic that we've decided is basically the geopolitical situation involving the military uh, arm of India. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Adi. Thanks for calling me. and Looking forward to the discussion. Let's start. Sir, uh, I'm going to just start the discussion on a very basic uh, question, sir. We yeah. are a very diverse military. We've yeah. got oceans, we've got rivers, we've got the desert, we've got the mountains, and we've got the plains as well. Having said that, does this kind of a diverse situation which is there in the country, does it uh, lead to any advantage when we are stood up against the PLA or the Pakistanis for that matter? Yeah, let's put it in a different, slightly different context. I mean, I'll get back to what you're saying, but I'll uh, put it in a holistic uh, the fact is that um, India has all kinds of terrain, high altitudes, jungles, riverine terrain, deserts, plains, coasts, everything, islands. You have to defend all, right? And this has been there with us ever since independence, in fact, ever since British days. Right? We've developed an expertise in all kinds of warfare. So, to that extent, uh, the kind of diversity of terrain has ensured that our army, navy, and air force have grown into this diversity. Ever since, you know, through history. It's not new, it's through history. The second thing is that as a young nation with unsettled borders, you know, after all, when we came, it became a nation, we neither had a western border or a northern border. I mean, there were no borders. They were all artificially created. Uh, you know, in the old days, it was only frontiers. Right? Plus, there were populations who were not part of India. So, we've been faced with regular and irregular warfare mm. ever since our independence. And if you just take the 1962 operations out of the equation, uh, we have fought wars in all kinds of terrain and successfully. 1962 was an aberration. And we've been very adept at defending our frontiers or borders as they've evolved or the lines of actual control. Or, so that's an evolution. And we've fought different uh, insurgencies and separatist movements and things like that, whether it's in you know, JNK or in the Northeast or Punjab, or wherever, right? Uh, so this has given us a very, very, very diverse uh, experience. And what's more, uh, the Indian Armed Forces, right from the inception, have followed a system where everyone is exposed to everything. In your service, a, a normal army officer would have served in high altitude, would have served in the deserts, in the plains, you would have had a few tenures in the you know, counterinsurgency. And that gives them a broad understanding of uh, all kinds of you know, operations, all kinds of geopolitical and uh, you know, national, nationally political issues. Uh, so that gives us great strength. Okay, Of course, as you grow all up in life, uh, certain officers do get certain degree of specialization in you know a, a particular uh, uh, theater or along a particular border that's uh, there but uh, our base is pretty well grounded and i'll say this even for the air force and the navy uh, like the Navy, the Arabian Sea is different from the Indian Ocean as different from the Bay of Bengal and the Indian territories, uh, island territories. So they get tremendous exposure. And plus the fact that, you know, their uh, their outlook is right from the beginning 
pretty big right from you know the gulf of uh, aden to the malacca straits mm. so they had they grew up with a great outlook and the indian air force is uh, you know again they actually i have seen my own friends grow uh, uh, flying various kinds of aircraft in various kinds of terrain and conditions and carrying out various kinds of roles whether it's uh, hdr disaster relief or you know regular operations or operations in support of counter insurgency mm-hmm. so our grounding is fantastic you know, that's uh, our strength also that's what enables us to deal with uh, you know uh, strong armies like pla and the pakistan army so i have a question now you mentioned yeah. about uh, us fighting a war of some sort or the other right from our um, independence time yeah if you look at us and if you look at the country of israel pretty much in a similar situation surrounded by uh, much stronger force around it now they have a very simple deterrence model it works or it not works is for time to tell it is hardcore offensive so if somebody raises a finger they go break three fingers and come back we have a, a doctrine called defensive offense um my question to you is these are two different doctrines for similar situations surrounding both the countries do you think we are on the right doctrine uh, as uh, to the defensive uh, offense is concerned we don't have anything called defensive offense as a doctrine the no doctrine right for us for once at best you could say we are more defensive in nature and more reactive in nature okay okay israel if you you have to understand israel the way it was born it was born on the uh, back of the balfour De- declaration and it got into a war of survival from beginning with arab nations all around and they had a different outlook and they grew differently if they weren't as offensive as they were at that some at some point of time and didn't grow along that line they probably wouldn't have survived as a nation right and you also have to remember that israel is a small nation small nations behave differently us is a huge nation diverse nation diverse problems you know and large ramifications of uh, uh, any uh, offensive or a defensive mm. any any military action has got large ramifications plus the fact that you know we were born out of a almost a revolution independence movement is nothing sort of a revolution right and and this revolution was based on non violence our principles from the beginning were you know non alignment no fight peace uh, you know our outlook was non interference cooperation you know that kind of a thing so i we could never as a nation uh, we have never been offensive we have never sought anything from anyone okay so that's how it is you can't it's you can't compare israel and india's position it's like apples mm. and oranges comparison incomparable so, so i i i mean that's where i leave it it's a way of looking at it i guess yeah it's a way of looking at it i understand a lot of people feel that we should behave like israel i don't think so because today israel is in a lot of trouble on many issues because of their uh, outlook their off- o- overtly offensive outlook mm. right so we we are not there our strengths are different mm. so um you mentioned one time I, i i think we were talking offline and you had mentioned to me that we have to learn how to analyze the pla and try and get its get on to its uh, you know get him on its knees by acting on its weaknesses yeah what do you think <laughs> those weaknesses are okay see uh, the pla is uh, first and foremost it's not a national army it's not china's army it's the military wing of a party mm. right uh, so and it's a political army and as a political army it's heavily indoctrinated right and there's a funny thing you know about the pla uh, that it is indoctrinated right from everyone 
they told look the pla is very good it has defeated great armies it has never suffered a loss and it has defeated greater adversaries and more advanced adversaries it's a lie it is repeated it is repeated so often that everyone believes it mm. and this is also put across as propaganda to everyone for coercion and right so it's a two way sword which cuts others and it cuts them also mm. so they build a halo of invincibility and that can get shattered very fast okay the second problem with the with the pla uh, if you call it a weakness is that it's a conscript army mm. people every year nearly 20, 20 to 25% of the army is turned over and that's that places very high demands on training induction deinduction unit morale unit cohesion all that uh then the next thing which i will put is that they are indec- they modernizing the pla is modernizing at a tremendous rate modernization means new weapons new mm-hmm. weapons means change change any system in change is unstable that's the first thing i mean like if you are you are start it's newton's law okay and right and any system uh, which changes from one state to the other mm-hmm. uh, is susceptible to a fall okay so this change destabilizes pla plus the fact that so many new equipment coming in and many of them might not function in all kinds of terrain so there are there's an issue plus new equipment has to be absorbed you can't just because you have new equipment tomorrow it's not going to be effective mm. induction of a new equipment takes at least 3 to 4 years in army any army anything below that that means that's a dud it might not function at all mm. right so it takes time oh so i i mean these are the things but the main thing with them is that uh, they are all a single child system see this uh, their demographics and the single child policy of 70s is hitting them now today now that single child policy came in 72 today we are in 21 nearly 50 years so anyone below 50 years would be all single child that means all unit commanders brigade commanders company commanders are all single child generally i as as per estimates anything between 70 to 80% of the pla would be single child now single child means lot as per them they are called little emperors who are supp- and these and these little emperors are not amenable to military discipline they are pampered mm. uh, you know uh, self centered that's not what uh, is good for uh, the army mm. where you need cohesion and things like that plus the moment you are a single child in the chinese take there's a problem what happens is now it's a actually life problem in the society this single child has to support his father and mother and his father uh, i mean his grandparents so this one chap has to support six people on top mm-hmm. plus his child single child so seven this one guy is has to support seven if he goes seven people are done so that pension system is not good and if they are not from great families wealthy families they face problems mm. i don't know what the state does for these martyrs families and all but there are issues so there are psychological issues so a guy who's just imagine an army full of such people uh, you know they they might not be forthcoming when their life is under danger mm. sacrifice all these things are difficult and uh, that is uh, thing then of course there's the issue of this this political business i'll get back you know when you indoctrinate a chap and with your political ideology see in all our brains we have only that much brain yeah politics seeklo or you will learn about uh, uh, your weapon system or military okay now 
if the emphasis is more on politics you can't handle your weapon systems and your military things well mm. now the thing the offshoot of that is and if that item is new you can't handle it well so it, it's a you know these are the things which uh, come out right uh, so there are issues then the leadership it's all centralized so there is no initiative okay it's all centralized the party system is, and it's dual there's a political commissar and a normal guy and that so any decision which is taken by the field commander is has to be scrutinized by the political chap and then allowed to go through and this goes through right to the top so that is a major issue then the a major problem of pla is lack of experience you're not for campaigns with all this remember, imagine if you're not for campaigns you're not had experience no ci ops no regular ops how can you perform and then to compound it all you want to do a global role mm. and their mission set is what is in tibet is different from what is required for taiwan is different from what is required for you know global dominance okay so they have i think major issues mm. and i'm not talking of you know geopolitical outlook okay wo i'm talking of unit level problems you can mm. target if you target them and mind you this has been borne out in galwan and you know, they can't take body bags i don't think they can take the single child policy and all has you know cramped down on their body bag business so they have they have issues and i think uh, if you can focus on those issues you can nullify pls great military advantage or technical technological advantage and weight of numbers and this and that you can how do you do that you know, exp- well it's a very you know, large you know, look at unit level you i mean let me give you a simple thing they talk of informationized warfare hmm. that means they seek information technologically right so they don't do patrolling too much they want surveillance this that and all so feed information through that just feed wrong information then they have to the another thing see for example in a india china scenario the fight is in himalayas tibet okay so if you can use some tibetans to do something in the rear they have to fight 360 degrees mm. simple start a propaganda that look you will get if you die you know your what will happen to your parents what will happen to your child no one will take care of you and do exactly what they do to you back to them propaganda we should have a lot of people writing about these things mm. there should be symposiums international things where you know people they get it it have you have to attack them psychologically a psychologically defunct man you give him anything he will not fight correct and this has to be attacked uh, the way i look at it not in one direction from the top from the bottom all directions i mean these weaknesses are live we need to have a strategy to attack the weakness of the pla mm. let me again put it in a different context mao said that the human capital and morale is more important than you know everything else use that same dictum back to them so the methods i'm sure you know when people start thinking like what i'm saying you'll get answers yeah i'm sure sir mm. but it's just a very curious factor yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know one thing that one can actually realize when uh, when we were having just this very conversation is that to beat an enemy you must must weaken him internally Mm. Tibet uh-huh. is one thing that you mentioned. Yeah. 
and they are trying to do that to us they did it in assam they did it in lot of other places we have a whole lot of uh, red flag carrying people who call china as their head of yeah. and stuff like that how do we go about doing something like that within china yeah you you have to internally uh, you know cut him down if i may say what are the fault lines apart from tibet no no see one is tibet and xinjiang are fault lines hmm okay so if the pla knows that his rear is going to get affected he is in a problem hmm he has to put resources in the rear you don't have to put you have to put him in a asymmetric situation what is pakistan doing to us whatever pakistan is doing to us in jnk do the same thing to china and tibet i mean let's be this is real politics the extend the battle zone into his depth first and this could be wherever you know i mean it, uh, it could be far into tibet hmm. this is one the second is psychological operations the fault lines of that single child policy fault lines of his not being trained you know such operations hmm. i mean let look at it we used sff in that kailash range operation what effect did it have hmm. same thing you should do you upset the you know balance of this balance hmm. then like i said information battlefield is a fluid situation everyone wants information in the battlefield use it media or media should be used as a tool of war okay make people think differently uh, if we can do all these you will find that these fault lines can be exploited i am very sure Mm. it's only that you know uh, we have not uh, really focused on these uh, issues so far and uh, to a large extent the pla and the china and china were a bit of a dark hole for mm. all of us but now with this has happened and we know that we have to focus on china i'm sure people will start thinking on these lines remember PLA cannot be defeated ideal uh, kinetically. PLA functions on an ideology, and that ideology has to be defeated non-kinetically. Mm. Your nine, it could be religion. Religion, religion is a powerful tool. How you exploit it is your choice. Mm. Okay, so you have different methods of doing it, and I am not talking of. state methods i'm talking of unit level formation level methods small hmm. small methods yeah that's uh, interesting sir very interesting so my next question may sound a little weird yeah you know with the uh post, i think i would say positioning or the 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 way that two countries north korea and pakistan position themselves around the world they seem like the biggest threat to peace around the world today iran of course yes but iran can be dealt with and both of these north korea and pakistan are you know supported supplied run by china in some one way or the other do you think is the chinese plan to create these po- proxies of its who can keep threatening the world and china comes out as one of those people who can control them is it is a you you you're there i'll i'll i mean there's no doubt in my mind that that's what china does I'll, but i'll put it in a slightly different method hmm. china can control them to a point not beyond that's the first thing because both the countries are kind of mavericks but china handles these mavericks and supports these mavericks to be mavericks exactly yes they want them to be mavericks like let me explain to you north korea is on the eastern flank pakistan on the western flank exactly yes through pakistan they can create situations in the middle east west asia and this belt okay through 
North Korea, they can create instability in the Asia Pacific region. Any instability these fellows create has international ramifications. They don't threaten China. They'll threaten India or US interests or other interests. Uh, it's an organized way of saying, okay, yeah, things are going tough. Like these days, if you see North Korea has a lot of lot news. I watch, it's got to know this thing. So he does, it's been instigated to do something. Mm. Of course, Pakistan is in a different uh, mess at this point of time. So it's not that effective. But at some point of time, Pakistan is as effective. So these are two mavericks uh, supported by China, allowed to do what they want. Because whatever chaos they create is adds to China's kitty. Yes. And detracts it from this thing. They could be independent. And when needed, they can be instigated. They need not be controlled. Use of these two, uh, you know, catch paw, I call them catch paw, uh, is pre- presaged on their being not controlled. Mm. Letting them free. Okay, so that's how they are handled. Interesting, sir. One thing uh, one can also note that the Chinese have been at work constantly, even when the United States seems to be asleep at the switch. The Chinese have struck a deal with Iran. This has been on in the pipeline for a long time, yes. Uh, but at this point of time, when the US is tugging on one side, the Chinese are putting in money on the other side, it creates a bit of a disbalance within this region. Uh, what look, about this, sir? Uh, yeah, look, I wouldn't blame uh, President Biden for this. Mm. Or that he's asleep and all. Look, he's just two months into his job. He's been handed a bad situation with Iran. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what Obama did, right? Obama was trying to mend fences with Iran. Mm. Trump jettisoned that whole story and Took it the other way around. Mm. Now to reverse that whole thing within then in two months is difficult. Mm. Not possible. It's, and you have to remember that you know America itself is a bit unstable at this point of time. Yes. Internally, whether it's COVID or because of their uh, uh, politics, say, uh, with their uh, internal political divide, so they are not that thing that they can come out firing with all cylinders on everything. Mm. They are looking at the major issues like China and you know COD and things like that, mm. right? So at this point of time, uh, and this Iran-China deal was in the making for the past two years. Yes. And China needs energy, and if Iran cannot sell that energy, fossil fuels, so they've stuck a deal. It was natural. Mm. I mean, there's nothing great about it. Yes. Will it continue in the next 25 years? Question mark. Because Iran has never been, Iran toes its own line. Right? So that is a difficult thing. They've struck a deal, fine. At this point of time, it's a deal of mutual convenience and long term and all that. Whether it will happen or not, we'll see. So, why I ask this question is because we have interest in Iran as well. Yeah, we'll have we have to deal with it. That's a situation which uh, we uh, ourselves we've had a great equation with Iran, and we've been dependent on them for oil. And we've had a problem mm. at some point of time. We had to tell, sorry, we can't take your oil. Till then, otherwise, we were doing everything on repo payments for them. Yes, things were good. So these are things which you know we have we had to handle. I don't see these things reversing that fast. So. Good thing is we have started mending fences with Iran, mm. Chabahar port and you know, all that. So we will have to Work tackle with. it. Yes, that's interesting, sir. So is yeah. today China because this is something which people can see about two years. I mean, two years ago, people had started talking about this. The Chinese are quite sick of Pakistan. They don't openly admit it, but there are hints of it. And with this now, you know, pushing towards uh, Iran, trying to get into Afghanistan, is 
are the Chinese today looking out at creating another option for themselves to get into, uh, you know, the, the Gulf in some way or the other? Because they know if Pakistan does not serve them, they need that option. See, one thing you should understand. Hmm. Come what may, uh, Pakistan-China will go together always. This is transient, this one-year, two-year business. Mm -hmm. Pakistan was one of the first nations to recognize the People's Republic of China. Yes. Okay. And going back to 1450. 49, yes. Okay. And they've always supported China for everything mm -hmm. against India. That was the basic thing. They are the ones, Pakistan is the ones who midwifed the relationship between USA and China. Mm. Well, this step Kissinger came to Pakistan and Pakistan, he, from Pakistan he flew to uh, China to meet Mao and normalize the relationship. So it was Pakistan. So come what may. Uh, and it was China which gave them all the nuclear and missile yes. uh, you know, proliferation of the technologies mm. was through China. So their relationship that way is pretty strong. What you're saying is all temporary. Yes. Okay. Okay. And it is Pakistan again, which has facilitated China's entry into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So of course, China would have gone anywhere on its own, but Pakistan, you know, has its links with the Middle East and China and you know, so you look at it that this thing, this relationship won't go off in a hurry. Mm. Won't get watered down in a hurry. Okay. So leave it at that. So interesting. It's going to be a long lasting relationship of a yeah, it's going to be, proxy yeah, state. It, yeah, yeah. On the Eastern Front. So our, our observation of North Korea and Pakistan is going to hold pretty strong. Yeah, yeah it's going to be there. We are going to have a problem with both. So I have a last question. North Korea. Uh, not with North Korea as much as with Pakistan. Pakistan, sure. Yes, sir. I have a last question for you, sir. In recent times, we've seen military minds getting involved in diplomacy in India. The, you know, army chiefs starting to visit around the place. Uh, the talks between India and Pakistan were conducted by military, the military leadership, along with the diplomats. In it. it was previously the other way around. There's been, you know, um, very little presence of the military here and there. So it's a two-part question. One, what would you like to see happening in terms of this changing trend? And what is it that you can take away from the situation that we are in today and how we are trying to handle everything else? See, you know, if you go back in our history, the military has been kept out of Indian geopolitics. Mm. Maybe. 71 ops, 71 war, we were there. Yes. But after that, we've been kept on the sidelines. And international diplomacy and geopolitics was largely run, run uh, through the MEA. Mm. But our experience of the recent, say, past two decades has been that it has come at the great price. They've lost opportunities because the military was not there. Mm. One. Secondly, the world is changing. You can't run as India is changing, the world is changing, and you want to be a great power. You can't run and be a great power with just your diplomacy or your administrative services. The military has to come in. Mm. Geopolitics, geostrategy without military is a most non starter. So your military diplomacy has to kick in, one, uh, the second part. Third, all nations which are, which is seek power, use military as a major uh, tool of diplomacy. Okay. And who will deal with the other militaries, if but your military? What people don't, I mean, let, let, let's take the US-India strategic relationship. It's a 2 plus 2 dialogue. What is this 2 plus 2 dialogue? 2 plus 2 is one is ex, uh, State Department and Foreign Affairs. Mm. Second is Defense. Mm. 
right a great part of our strat- indo us strategic relationship is uh, based on defense cooperation yes. so automatically your military has to come forward and if we want to be a power of consequence india doesn't have a choice but to take its military forward and that is it's a good sign that like our chief went to the middle east he went to myanmar you know people have been going abroad and talking uh, you know which is great we are on the right lines mm. i again i'll not look back and say why we didn't do it that's gone that's a waste oh. of time mm. let's look ahead should we like i said in the last discussion we had if india seeks to be a great power you need a troika the troika has military prowess diplomatic ability okay and your economic strength mm. you have to build these three yes in in the right proportion okay and that has to be underpinned by the political uh, strength mm. so if you don't have the military in your pie you you know your pie is incomplete mm. right so else would be right happening in this field sir see i will put it i think that's a big question we'll leave it for another day so we we'll discuss right. it with the this thing but increasingly the military has to get it for example for the first time we've had military led talks with china yes the change we never had this before so there's a change which is happening within us and uh, that change has to be a little more analyzed and we have to put it in the right perspective as to how to take it forward mm mm okay so this has connect with atmanirbhata and this atmanirbhata has connect with not only military with others you are look you have to look at civil military fusion you have to look at you know uh, political military equations mm and uh, and the role of the bureaucracy and your uh, diplomacy in that uh, other issues which are there mm-hmm. which i think that we need we'll we could take this on on a so sure, i'll be honored sir yeah yeah we'll okay. do that i thank you so much for this uh, the time that you've offered for a wonderful discussion on various different issues surrounding india today sir and to all of us all of the viewers who're going to see this video i'm going to try and get uh, jan shankar once again to talk about military diplomacy that india can do and what he would like to see happening in the next some time we'll prepare on this and come back to you in some time thank you so much sir uh, once again for the time and uh, i'll hope to see you back very soon thanks thanks a lot thank you